With barely three months left before the Democratic Governance Facility, DGF, winds up its operations in Uganda, civil society organizations and some critical government sectors are facing a financial squeeze as critical programs that directly uplift the underclass have been halted and redundant staff followed. The Basket Fund, supported by eight EU states, provides the largest financial war chest to over 60 non-government organizations, local governments and agencies whose operations seek to, among others, promote the rule of law, human rights, good governance, conduct civic education and provide free legal aid services. This young man who preferred anonymity is among us thousands of employees who have been sent home. And imagine a person like me who has been working somewhere and earning some modest amount of money. I wake up one day and I don't know where to start from. Our boss actually had no choice. She terminated our contracts because she knew that DGF had closed and yet she had no funds to facilitate us. Personally, the units that have been working in had quite a number of staff, about eight people that I was working with in the unit. And uh, that unit alone cannot be sustained if DGF is not here. With the rising consumer price inflation, many of those in job calls have already spent their poultry savings. Established in 2011, the DGF was currently in its second phase, running from 2018 to 2022. Whereas by design, the program was meant to end in December, civil society actors anticipated an extension. They believe that the fetters imposed on the facility by the government while lifting its suspension is to blame for its closure. We received an er array of hope. It had been opened up to December. And then we were happy, but we began questioning why up to December? We expect the, 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 the reopening or the, of the lifting of the suspension not to have any conditionalities. So we began questioning, but we maybe we thought probably this is a period for them to open, close off the F2, and then we transition into um, a new facility strategy. And so to our surprise, around I think August, I think the communications now came in, flowing in, and they were all indicating closure. Cross off. You may want to pepper spray us. Barely before the 2021 general election, the DGF facility was suspended after the president received dossiers from intelligence that under the veil of providing support to NGOs, the fund and its puppet masters had an imperialistic agenda to prop up the opposition ahead of the general election in 2021. The government targeted individuals, including Simon Osborne, who was detained, cut off to the airport and deported in 2020. An influential figure in the diplomatic community, Osborne was the advisor for the European Union on elections in Uganda. A senior media executive at a government-owned newspaper was among the first victims of this dossier as he was sacked on the premise of receiving funds to facilitate the production of investigative stories. The president, in the letter to the finance minister, Matia Kasaija, accused the then permanent secretary, Keith Makanezi, of having irregularly and unilaterally licensed DGF. Makanezi has since been dropped from the powerful docket of secretary to the treasury to the office of the prime minister and has been replaced by Ramadan Gowi. On June 22 this year, Nearly two years after its suspension, the president lifted the ban after meeting with the Danish Minister for Development Cooperation, Fleming Miller Monsen. According to a press statement issued then and I quote, the president's promise came following an appeal by Honorable Monsen and the Danish ambassador who said that the project has only six months left to elapse. But beyond the contents of the embellished intelligent dossiers, the DGF facility offered financial assistance to a number of government agencies like the National Environmental Management Authority and the Justice Law and Order Sector, amongst others. As the facility closes this year, the Justice, Law and Order Sector has been hit the hardest. It is bad news because it helps the vulnerable people. 
for us who cannot afford, for those who don't have much money, it has been helpful to us. Because to me, they have take, they took me throughout the legal process for free of charge. And sometimes they could give me transport. There is an acute and met need for legal aid and free legal services for the indigent in Uganda, which lack the resources to implement a comprehensive national legal aid system. This leaves a significant number of Ugandans without government-provided legal aid or resources to afford hired counsel. With the exit of the mouth donor facility, there is likely an increase of case backlog and delayed access to justice to the poor. Now, with the closure of DGF, uh, it leaves a very huge gap. Very huge gap. At the moment, at the moment we have over 7,000 cases that are going on. The 7,000 cases are still within the court system, which we are actually handling and representing people. Now, with the closure, these are going to store. It means that they are going, there is going to be an increased case backlog within, within, within the judiciary itself. And it means that actually the, the people we are representing will go without access to justice. And for me, it, it is the biggest worry. The rich will always have their way in, th through the system. Where are the poor going to run to? According to Aaron Vesje, the National Coordinator Justice Centers Uganda, over 7,600 cases in various courts could stall with the closure of DGF. Most of these cases are related to land evictions, domestic violence, administration of estates, and human rights abuses, among others. I'm worried that he, if, even the presses, the way we are been making interventions, are going to, to get back to its full capacity. For example, if I can give you a district like, like Muvende, we had actually eliminated uh, at Muvende CPS. You would not go there and find somebody who has been on re, or, or, uh, in police cells beyond 48 hours because we had somebody who was permanent going to check uh, uh, check on those suspects and would actually make sure those suspects are either released or committed to court. But at the moment, nobody will go there. And so the issue of human rights abuse and, and, and human rights observance is going to get worse. Justice Centers Uganda JCU is a project of the Government of Uganda which started in December 2009 as legal aid clinic that seeks to expand the frontiers of justice to the grassroots. It has been running a three-year project with DGF on enhancing access to justice in Uganda through providing comprehensive quality legal aid services and empowering vulnerable people and communities. With 80% of its funding supported by DGF, VSJ says 13 legal aid service centers could shut down and 73 lawyers could lose their jobs. Figures from Justice Centers Uganda show that the DGF has funded them with over 40 billion shillings since 2010. Dr. Slivia Nambiru, the Chief Executive Officer, Legal Aid Service Providers Network in Uganda, LASPNET, which has been getting 80% of its funding from DGF, said they are being forced to scale down on their staff and operations. We are not going to be as uh, visible, probably, as we used to be. If we are engaging in advocacy activities, the, if the staff responsible for advocacy is not there, you don't expect the CEO to be everywhere. Even if the CEO is volunteering and has remained in working. Um, so now uh, many of the staff will be volunteering. There will be more of like volunteers and those are the willing. No one is going to volunteer with. Because this marriage really without benefit. And it's understandable. They have to survive. LASPNET, which has been a partner of DGF for 14 years, has been running a project on strengthening collaborative advocacy platforms to enhance rule of law, legal aid and access to justice for the poor, vulnerable and the marginalized in Uganda. The exit of DGF also has a significant financial and economic impact on Uganda's economy. 
Julius Mokonda, the executive director of the Civil Society Budget Advocacy Group, CSBAG, whose organization has been getting 40% of DGF funding, told NTV that government is bound to lose billions in revenue and a number of economic activities will be disrupted. This bag here, we were paying, uh, my audited reports were saying we were paying uh, uh, you know, around 328 million Ugandan shillings in terms of taxes, just this bag. Uh, DGF was contributing almost 40% uh, to our funding. So, I mean, you can put uh, the amount there, it is 120 plus millions. That is money for gold in terms of revenues that the government of Uganda was supposed to collect from CS bag. So they are not going to collect that in the next coming financial year. It's not going to be there. Now, if DGF was funding more than 60 partners, you know what that means in terms of revenue for a gun for the country. So when you hear that the URA is struggling to collect the revenue, it's because of some of these uh, uh, policies that really affect the collection and expansion of, tax special, of taxes, ex uh, taxation, expansion of revenue based in this country. So that's one economic impact that is likely to have. The other economic impact, of course, is that... Uh, when you withdraw this kind of amount of money, then you, you can imagine the economic activities that are going to be disrupted. So, if you're supposed to be having five workshops in the field, I mean, you know, you see, a workshop in a district, the returns are so high. The relationship between the state and the civil society in Uganda continues to deteriorate. The Supervisory NGO Bureau in September 2021 suspended 54 NGOs on the premise of violating registration requirements. Other NGOs have been probed over money laundering charges as government seeks to constrict their oversight role. The environment for civil society or NGOs to be operating in Uganda has become very hostile. It is arising from, in my view, a lack of understanding of the role that NGOs play in advancing and nurturing democracy in Uganda. And I think that that needs to be, that, that role of NGOs needs to be better appreciated. But the truth is that where we, we recognize that a number of stakeholders, especially in government, um, do not fully understand the role of NGOs in promoting accountability, in promoting the fight against corruption, in promoting rule of law, which is very important for Uganda to advance in its development trajectory, in its democratization process. So NGOs stand in... As the state remains unrelenting in its pursuit to torpedo civil society, some are imploring government to seek dialogue. I think we need to, to change the narrative. The narrative in terms of who are these civil society organizations that really, because for government, it believes that civil society organizations disrupt government business. I think we need to change that narrative because we contribute to the development of this country. Because if I, Julius from CSBA, come up and say, this headmaster with the primary school has been eating the money, it is in the best interest of government. If I come up and say that parish development money has been eaten in a particular district, I don't think there is a, there is a, it is a policy of NLM that people should eat government money. Others want alternative methods of resource mobilization. We put in place a mechanism which we call the solidarity fundraising, meaning you uh, can, as an individual, decide that every month I'm going to contribute 5,000 shillings to the work that Axon Aid is doing. I really identify with that work and I'm going to put money there. Our staff do it, our board does it, and we have other ordinary citizens who are putting money, maybe 5,000, maybe. With the government grappling to pay workers and as the economy gravitates towards the recessional cliff, how will government fill the void left? Uh, sometime back, there was a cost-benefit analysis of providing legal aid. Um, and, 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 and government needs again to, to go back to that study which was, which was conducted and, and begin treating illegal aid as a big sector within. And also g begin giving it a priority among the priorities that is considering. Because without actual legal aid, 
then you are going you are going to find that uh, more human rights abuses is going to increase that more people are going to lose their land and itself it will be a very big security risk and threat to this country and but i can tell you that if there is any security situation that is going to rise in uganda again it will it will come as a result of land injustice that is being done i have no doubt about it NTV has been reliably informed that DGF is holding talks with a number of its partners as it winds up business in the country. I'm not going to state what the development partner has told us. They are closing DGF too. Okay? Now, the discussions, of course, are valid because a civil society organization would want to know what is causing DGF to close if they so wish to tell us. Or what is that terrain that we need to navigate? Or what lessons are we picking from this scenario? But again, as they are closing out, how can they help civil society to remain afloat without doing what we call do no harm? Because they've hugely invested in civil society in Uganda. I think the partners we have had with the DGF is one, regarding the sustainability of some of the intervention that, you, that, that they were making and also them trying to understand whether actually we, we can sustain the sector within. And we have told them the only way we can sustain the intervention is government take, taking it up its role. But then the provision of legal aid is, 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 is a government of Uganda uh, role. It, it, it can never be a donor, a donor responsibility. Transitioning from donor funding towards domestic financing presents major challenges, especially at the time the economy is in a tailspin.